students a warm good morning to one and all of you welcome back to the new session and today we're going to talk about the bacterial nutrient update just like all the living organisms or the macro organisms which we find across the micro organisms also require energy as well as nutrients for their survival if they do not get energy and if they do not get nutrients they cannot survive in this ecosystem so they always try uh, to obtain nutrients as well as energy for the survival and where do they get it from they mainly get it from the environment but uh, if a bacteria has to get the energy the energy or energy or the nutrients the nutrients should in fact uh, pass across the plasma membrane because the plasma membrane acts as a barrier or a semi permeable barrier uh, for the bacteria so if a bacteria has to get nutrients these nutrients should pass across a plasma membrane and where does the energy comes from the energy synthesis it mainly happens within the plasma membrane taking the nutrients which it has obtained from the environment the bacteria itself can synthesize energy and sometimes the nutrients are broken down and it gets energy so you can see that uh, nutrients are broken down by the process of catabolism and they get energy from that and uh, at the same time this energy is used and uh, they will do the process of uh, anabolism or the building up of uh, biological molecules happen and then what happens macro elements are being used and cellular processes do happen within the body so the process of uh, nutrient uptake and the energy generation is being found to be linked together within a microorganism but at the same time you can see that uh, it can also obtain energy from the from the atmosphere now some microorganisms can utilize the solar energy and they can uh, also do various other techniques such as a photosynthesis also so in the coming units uh, we would be talking about how bacteria takes up nutrients how does it metabolize these nutrients and obtain energy and at the same time how does it utilize the solar energy by photosynthesis and then uh, synthesize its own carbohydrate within its body so the coming sessions uh, will consist of three different aims one is how microorganisms take nutrients the second one how do they metabolize it and how do they themselves synthesize sometimes synthesize energy by photosynthesis so let's move on to the first session of this that is the nutrient uptake by microorganisms if you go to consider the nutrients nutrients which bacteria takes it can be divided mainly into three different types they could be as micronutrients micronutrients as well as the growth factors as the term implies you can see that macronutrients are those which are being needed in large quantities the micronutrients are the ones which are required in small quantities and the growth factors are some additional factors which are being needed for the growth of the organisms so let's go into the details of them uh, the main macronutrients are the macro elements it mainly includes carbon oxygen hydrogen nitrogen sulfur and phosphorus and uh, they are required in large quantities and you can see that all these elements are uh, needed uh, for the synthesis of various biomolecules such as uh, proteins lipids nucleic acids and carbohydrates so uh, when these molecules are needed okay the quantity that is needed is being found to be large and hence that's why they are being called as macronutrients so in addition to these uh, like carbon hydrogen oxygen and all we also have uh, potassium calcium magnesium and iron which is being considered to be as a macro element in the case of bacteria 
these ions uh, they mainly occur as cations and they mainly contribute to the activity and the stability of molecules and cell structures such as enzymes and ribosomes coming to the next step of nutrient uh, that is a micronutrient or called the trace element so they are required normally in small amounts and uh, uh, what what does it means normally when you wash a glassware or from the water that you take or from the growth media uh, that is sufficient you know you now you get it in small quantities from all these things so you need not add these trace elements usually even in the water they would be present so we don't care much of the trace elements which have been needed about by the microbes and if you go to consider if you're growing it in a lab if they get it from the water which is used or from the glassware which is being used or from the growth media which is in that the trace elements would be there and if you go to consider a, a microbe which is living in the nature you can see this these trace elements are being found to be ubiquitous ubiquitous or they are being present everywhere so uh, they would get it from the natural environment itself now examples uh, like you have manganese zinc cobalt molybdenum nickel copper and all that these are required in very small quantities for the my for the growth of the microorganisms and now what is the role of these micronutrients these micronutrients uh, they mainly aid in the catalysis of reactions and also in the maintenance of the protein structure so we got about the micronutrients the macronutrients and now let's move to the next one called the growth factors as i told you uh, growth factors are certain additional elements which are ne needed for the survival of the microorganisms and usually they obtain it from the environment and uh, the microorganisms are in fact unable to synthesize any of these bio molecules that is to be noted in the case of macronutrients and micronutrients they are the building blocks which are being used for the bio organic molecules but here in the growth factors these growth factors are in fact already they uh, these cannot be synthesized by the bacteria and uh, they have to they have to be obtained from the environment as such preform so they mainly includes like uh, amino acids purines pyrimidines and vitamins these are some of the growth factors uh, which cannot be synthesized by the microbe and it and it needs it for the survival so since you got an uh, idea about what are the nutrients which are being needed by the microorganisms now let's see how we can uptake all these nutrients first and foremost we should keep in mind uh, if a nutrient has to enter into the bacteria it should be soluble soluble in water and it should move across the plasma membrane to enter into the bacterial cell if it is insoluble in water and if it is not being able to move across the plasma membrane the bacteria will not get that particular nutrient and the bacteria uses different mechanisms to uptake nutrients and uh, mainly there are five different mechanisms like the passive diffusion facilitated diffusion active transport group translocation and citrophores in this session uh, i would be talking about the passive diffusion and the facilitated diffusion in the second session we would continue with the active group translocation of the citrophores uh, now what is diffusion diffusion uh, when you look at the term diffusion it is always the movement of something from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration we have come across the diffusion the term diffusion of gases and all that which happens normally so in the case of diffusion that itself can be of two different types passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion first let's see what is passive diffusion as i told you a uh, diffusion is a process where the molecules will move from a region of higher concentration to a lower concentration and uh, that is they move down the concentration gradient and uh, and the rate of the passive diffusion that mainly uh, depends upon the size of the concentration gradient between the cells exterior and the interior now if you have a bacterial cell you have a plasma membrane and the 
environment around uh, outside the plasma membrane is considered to be as the exterior. So, if there is a higher concentration of a particular substance uh, outside the cell, uh, that sub and if that molecule is being found to be very small enough to enter into the plasma membrane directly, then it moves from the region of higher concentration to the region of lower concentration, that is to the inside of the cell by the process of passive diffusion. And to be noted, here uh, nothing is involved in the diffusion, that is nothing is carrying the substance to be transported from the outside towards the inside. It is just moving from region of high concentration to the region of low concentration in passive diffusion. Various gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide etc. they can diffuse across the plasma membrane by passive diffusion and uh, water is also moving across the membrane by passive diffusion. But you can see that larger molecules uh, some they won't be able to diffuse passively and they would be need uh, or they would require the help of various other proteins for to enter into the cell. So in such cases we use the next type of method or the, the one called the what the facilitative diffusion. In passive diffusion you do not require proteins to transport it but the uh, molecules move from the region of higher concentration to the lower concentration against the concentration gradient. In facilitated diffusion you require the help of what Certain proteins uh, are needed for the what, transport of molecules across the plasma membrane. So, that proteins, as I told you in facilitated diffusion, they might, you might require some proteins for the transport. These transport proteins can be divided into two different types. One is a channel protein and the second one is a carrier protein. Now, what is a channel protein? A channel protein is a protein uh, which is having a pore through it. Okay. Now you just consider uh, it's just like mm, you take a you take your a, uh, if you take a particular block okay or a cell you just think a you, you consider take a block of wood or uh, take a block of wood and if you make a small if you drill a hole consider this wood as a protein. And if you drill a hole through the center of it so that there is a continuous pore through it and so that through the wood what happens you can pass substances across it. So that is a case of a channel protein. A channel protein is a protein which has pores in the membranes so that what happens through these pores the substances can pass and it is mainly involved in facilitated diffusion uh, and but in the case of carrier proteins they do not have Pose, but they are able to carry the nutrients across the membrane. Uh, now, what is the difference between these two? Uh, a channel has a continuous pore, a carrier does not have a continuous pore or anything. It can only bind to the protein and then transport it. And uh, uh, a channel is not being found to be very much uh, specific for the substances which can pass through them. That is, anything or almost everything can pass through a channel. But a carrier is being a carrier protein has been found to be highly substrate specific compared to a channel protein. Now we'll see how these transport proteins will help in the facilitated diffusion. And what are the features of the facilitated diffusion? If you consider the facilitated diffusion, uh, of course they require some proteins, and these proteins could be either channels or carriers, and uh, it is also happening against a concentration gradient that is mm, from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration that's how facilitated diffusion also happens but uh, it is not as uh, as fast as in the case of the passive diffusion that's what you should know. and uh, the mechanism of uh, facilitated diffusion is that sometimes if there is a protein over here in a plasma membrane now, they have showing a carrier protein. That's what they are showing, a carrier protein. Yeah? If there is a carrier protein, the carrier protein is, if it has been found to be outward facing, outward facing conformation will be present and the solute will bind onto it. And then, this carrier protein will undergo some modifications and it will 
undergo changes and take in. So the opening of the protein will go inside of the cell and the protein, uh, the substrate molecules will enter into the cell. So the example of a, a facilitated diffusion or the mechanism states that the protein which is being involved in it would undergo certain conformational changes so that the solute can enter into the protein or it comes into interact with the carrier protein and then it goes inside. So in this case, you can see that it is not having a throughout pore through the protein. That is, the protein is undergoing some conformation changes enabling the substrates which have been found to be in the outside of the cell to enter into the inside of the cell. If it is a channel, what would happen is there would be opening here as well as there would be opening here and the substrates could be just moved across it. So I guess you got an idea about facilitated diffusion. Another thing what I would like to say about facilitated diffusion is that uh, as we know that in facilitated diffusion what happens these are various, various carrier molecules which have been involved. So uh, as the concentration of the solute increases so you what you have to do you need something it's just like a, just like various carrier molecules they will interact with the protein or the solute which has to be transferred and then the solute carrier protein will give it towards the inside. So as the concentration of the solute increases beyond the level uh, there is a point at which all the proteins in it uh, all the carrier proteins will get saturated because if there are 100 if there are 100 solutes and uh, there are 100 carrier proteins 100 solutes will be interact with 100 carrier proteins and it is available to be transported considering one carrier protein transfers one solute. But if you have 150 solutes, poly, uh, uh, solute molecules and you have only 100 carrier proteins considering in the case that one carrier protein is carrying one solute, what would happen when 150 solute particles are there and only 100 so, uh, carrier proteins are there, the carrier proteins get saturated. So the rate of the carrier facilitated diffusion will get decreased here when at a particular concentration that is referred to as a saturation and if the concentration of the uh, only after once these particles or these solute particles have been transferred after that then further the uh, carrier facilitated diffusion can happen. So such a case of uh, saturation could happen in the case of carrier facilitated diffusion but in the case of passive diffusion such a case of saturation will not happen because proteins are not involved in uh, passive diffusion and it just happens against the concentration gradient. So let's note what are the key features of uh, facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is a true diffusion technique but a carrier protein is mainly involved and you can see that it is a concentration gradient which uh, drives the movement of the molecules. And no metabolic energy is required over here. And you, uh, to be noted, if the concentration gradient disappears, then there won't be any net inward movement. And uh, the technique of facilitated diffusion, uh, you can see it is uh, reported in some bacteria. But uh, this is not the major mechanism for nutrient uptake. But uh, because bacteria requires uh, what? larger quantities of uh, nutrients sometimes and uh, nutrients are being found only in low concentration sometimes in the environment. So in such cases they will go for the active transport mechanisms. But you can see that in some bacteria they do have facilitated diffusion. Hope so this is clear to you. We will continue with the active transport in the next session. Thank you for now.